Hello again and welcome to Forum for a Better Understanding. It was my privilege last week to visit with Marina Nimat, and again I have that joy to share her with you again as we continue her presentation about her life. And we've gotten up to the point of her release from the prison of Evin in Tehran, but now we're going to see how she took her experience and by about the year 2000, started doing something, as they say, about it. And then comes in 2007, a memoir, Prisoner of Tehran, in which she finally shares with the world what had been bottled up for so many years. Could you begin, Marina, this time by telling us just a little bit about how you ever ended up in 1991 in Canada with Andre and your beginning family? When I was released in 1984 from the prison, then I married Andre, and uh, we had a child, a little boy, and I hadn't really thought about what I'm going to do with my life in the long run. I just, when I was released, I just was happy to be alive and to be back with the people I loved. But then as time went by, I constantly felt the threat that I could be arrested again because I returned to the Catholic Church. And um, because I had converted to Islam in prison, now I had gone back to the church. Uh, this was against the law. And there was an automatic death sentence over my head because if you convert back to your old religion, you would be executed if the opportunity comes. And I was aware of this. So Andre and I, we decided to leave, but then the Iranian government wouldn't give me a passport. So anyhow, it took about six years to finally get a passport and then find a way to get out of the country. And uh, we first went to Spain and then we went to Hungary, well, where Andre has family because he's originally Hungarian. And uh, my brother was already in Canada. He had been in Canada for many years. He left in 1979, actually, and went to Canada. So Canada was where we had family. I had heard that yeah. it's a wonderful place, and we decided to go to Canada. And about a year after we left Iran, we landed at Pearson Airport in Toronto. And it's been a good life in Toronto. Now you're at the University of Toronto teaching, as we learned last week, a brand new course in Farsi. Brand new for the Persians to speak and write in their own language. And a lot of it to share your, their experiences as you were able to finally share yours. Now, around 2000 or so, you talk about flashbacks that start helping you come to grips with what it is that will become your literary life. What, what, what prompted those? What made you suddenly become so aware of what it was that was underneath? For all those years from 1984 to um, year 2000, I had tried to be normal. I had tried to block all the memories, all the images, and just to pretend that everything was okay because this was the easier way to go. I, I would have appreciated it if my f loved ones and my family, they had, uh, they had told me, Marina, when you're ready to talk about it, we are here to listen. But it didn't come. And you know what? I thought it's okay because I can forget it. I can move on. And I managed to do it. I looked like a very normal person. I was married. I had children in Canada. I had a job. I, I was a waitress uh, for many years. I worked in a restaurant. And all of my neighbors, if you ask them, they would have told you that I was the average normal okay. Canadian. And I thought I was going to uh, sustain this fictional version of myself forever. It looked like it. And then my, uh, we had brought my parents to Canada and they lived with me, and we had remained your average dysfunctional family for almost 20 years. We had only talked about the weather. Now, in Canada, it makes sense to talk it's about the weather. weather yeah. There. But, you know, so then my mother became ill, and she got cancer. And I was sitting at her bedside at the hospital, and I was looking at her, and I was thinking, I don't know this woman. If you talk with somebody only about the weather, how well do you really know them? Probably not that well. You're probably a weather expert, but rather than that, nothing more. And I wanted to ask her mom, why didn't you ever ask me? And, and I couldn't do it because she was suffering. So I watched her die. 
And then after her funeral, we went to my brother's house. And at the funeral, after the funeral, uh, my father was very distraught. He, they had been married for more than 50 years, and he was devastated. And when I went to sit down next to him at my brother's house, he, my father looked at me, and he said, Marina, your mother forgave you before she died. And I opened my mouth to say, what do you mean? And what came out was a never-ending scream. And I screamed, and I screamed, and I screamed, and I couldn't stop. And then I realized I can't breathe, so I'm trying to tell them, call 911. I couldn't. Eventually, they silenced me, and my husband put me in a car and took me home. And the next day, do you think I got a phone call <laughs> to say what was that? No, I didn't. And that was a psychotic episode. And I think it was so obvious that that wasn't grief. It was a, psych a serious psychotic episode. And I thought, OK. They don't want to deal with it, but, but I have to deal with this because this is driving me crazy. And I decided to write. But at the beginning, I had no intention to share it with anybody. I just thought, if I put it on paper, I will find closure. But I didn't. But you did in some way find some comfort, at least. And then what it says that you maybe wrote an 80-page uh, draft. You hid it in a draw that you thought no one would find. But eventually it does become something that Andre and you could talk about. Tell us how it was when finally Andre is able to find out what you've been writing. Well, when I wrote it, and I didn't feel any better, but I felt worse, actually, in many ways, I started having flashbacks and nightmares. I realized that just writing is not going to do it, that as long as I have secrets, I cannot find peace. Right. So I uh, told Andre that I had written, and I gave him that little manuscript, and I asked him to read it. And he put it under our bed, his side of the bed, and it just stayed there wow. for about three days. Wow. And he finally, I guess he found it in himself to pick it up and read. And he asked me, why didn't you tell me? sooner. And I said, I couldn't. And then he apologized to me for not asking. Wow, what a guy. He is. He's he wonderful. is. He's, he's a sweet, wonderful person. And then I told him, I need to publish this. And he said, yeah, I understand. So that's how the decision to publish the book came. And then once it was published, and then the world knew, and then the traveling began. And then, you know, everything just took off from there, oh, and yeah. I, I, was in, I was not in control at all. I, I, I just decided to follow whatever was happening. And I, I discovered that there is no such thing as closure. But what you do is you come face to face with what happened, with you, who you are. I became a witness. Yeah. And a witness is irrelevant if he or she doesn't testify. So as a witness, I have to stand up. I didn't choose this. I wanted to become a medical doctor. It didn't happen. So I might as well face it and say, this is who I am, and I will take responsibility for it. Now, have you any idea when it was published, this first of your books, that it would be such a, a phenomenon that 25 different language groups already have this book for them in their own cultures, in their own languages, in their own countries. Did you have any idea that you were going to be speaking for so many people? So how has that affected you, knowing you have been effectively able to release such interest in people? I never thought about that. For me, it was about telling the world what I knew. And now when I look back, the only thing I can compare it to is if you see a body of water and you want to cross it and you see these little stones sticking out of the water. So you jump on the first stone and then you jump on the second and then you jump on the third. And by the time you're on number 1,900,000, you realize that you're crossing the ocean. But you know what? You have already made it halfway through yeah. without even realizing how big it is. And I find that one thing has been leading to the next. 
And I never think about the destination of where this is going. I only think about the next stepping stone and where I'm supposed to put my foot next. So one next step, obviously, after Prisoner of Tehran in 2008, your second book, After Tehran, A Life Regained, Reclaimed. How easily did the second book follow the first and what has been um, your feelings about that second effort to share the continuing life that you lead? The second book actually came out in 2010. So it took me about three years after the first book to write the second. But when I published Prisoner of Tehran, um, you know, it ends with our leaving Iran and arriving in Canada. But I realized after it was published that there was still a lot more to say. In the first book, I tell about what happened from the perspective of a 16-year-old. It is not the voice of a 40-year-old. No, no. So I needed to go back and also put the voice of the 40-year-old in somehow, the perspective the an analyzing of everything, of every image, of every event. So, and the immigrant experience, I guess, because there are a lot of immigrants oh, yeah. out in the West who have very difficult stories to tell. And to share that journey with other people like me and to encourage them to share their stories and to stand up for it. So that is how the next book came to be. And Prisoner of Tehran would not have been complete without the second book. No. They complete each other. So I'm very glad that I was given this opportunity to complete it. It's, it's great to think that those who are going to enjoy reading, as I know you will, Prisoner of Tehran, a memoir, will want to find out, so what happens after that? And will it be in a different voice? Which it actually is, and it reads that way. It is a different literary style and a, and a very beautiful accomplishment. They're telling us once again we have to take a break, but please don't go far because in one minute I'll be back with Marina for the last part of our series in which she'll share some things more about the world of politics, the world of government, the world that we're living in today, less personal but perhaps um, still very interesting, her perception of the world today. Stay tuned. KNXT, the nation's only full-powered broadcast station owned and operated by a Catholic diocese in the U.S. and streaming live on the internet at knxt.tv. Need your support to keep the message of the good news alive? Just go to knxt.tv, click on the Make a Financial Gift, go to Donate, and fill out your one-time or monthly offering under PayPal. It's just that easy. Your donation makes it possible for KNXT, Catholic Television, to continue its ministry by celebrating the Mass and proclaiming the Gospel. Thank you from KNXT. Hello again and welcome to what's going to turn out to be our fourth segment with Marina Nimat, who wrote the book Prisoner of Tehran, a memoir, and after Tehran, a life reclaimed. And right now we're going to shift gears with her and let her tell us uh, some answers to some very difficult questions about the present world and what her own perception might be based on her own life having lived so much of what I'm going to ask her. Marina, could you tell us something to help our viewers a little bit from your point of view? Iran, Iranian people, and the Iranian government. Um, it's a loaded question, but can you distinguish those three things? You know what, Jim? I think every people, every country in the world, there are good people there and there are bad people there. I don't think you can call any people in the world bad people or any people in the world good people. There is always a combination of good and bad and I think the number of the good people is always greater than the number of the bad people. So it's the same thing with Iran. Iran has 
good people just like anywhere else just like the united states or germany or anywhere for that matter but iran has been so unlucky to have a very bad government and it is very important to, to understand that these are two very different things the iranian people are being held hostage by their own government and they are suffering as a result and iran is an ancient country it's the land that was called persia and it was an empire, it was one of the cradles of civilization and literature and art and you name it. So we cannot forget that this is the same country, that these are the same people yeah. and that they are just in a very difficult situation. Can you distinguish for us uh, a little bit about Sharia law and how significant it's been in Iran's yeah. past and in its present? During the time of the Shah, Iran was not governed by Sharia law. Iran was governed by a very Western, uh, West westernized um, set of rules that were, was, were, they were literally based on European law. Very similar to, I think, the laws of Belgium. I think that was the model mm -hmm. or something like that, yes. Uh, but then with the success of the revolution and when Ayatollah Khomeini came into power and he announced his, uh, himself to be the supreme leader of Iran, basically the supreme leader can veto the decisions of the president, the parliament, and the people. So he has the say in everything. Iran s seems to be an, a republic, but in reality, Iran is run by the supreme leader, and he is the one who has the last word. And the, the law in Iran is not that Western-style law anymore. It is based on Sharia law. For example, in Sharia law, the testimony of a woman is worth half of a man. The testimony of a Christian or a Jew or a Zoroastrian is worth half of that of a Muslim. The Baha'i are not even considered human beings and they don't have a right and they don't have a say and they could go to prison simply because of their religion. And they are in prison right now, many of them in Iran. What would you want to say about human rights? And this is one issue that you are really committed to. You were at the summit in New York in September over the issue of um, discrimination and persecution. Uh, what is the state of human rights, especially in Iran or anywhere else that you'd like to highlight? The sad well, state of human rights. You know, in Iran, as we were just talking, it's governed by Sharia law. And I don't know how you want to measure things, but I guess any method of measurement that you use, when a, you know, a, a, a certain set of laws, they say that a woman's testimony is worth half of a man, um, this cannot be just. So when the laws that are supposed to protect people, they are actually discriminating against certain minorities or certain genders or whatever else, this is not something that can be good for the people. So in Iran, um, for example, religious minorities, the people of the book, as they put it. Now, the people of the book, or Ahl al-Kitab, they are, according to Iranian law, Christians, or Austrians, and the Jews. They are supposed to be protected by the law, according to Iranian law. But in reality, I was there when the Islamic Republic came into power and for many years after. Even though, for example, Christians and the Jews and Zoroastrians have members of parliament, so they have representatives, at the end of the day, what the people want is not what they are given. For example, the Christian schools were taken away from the Christians. You know, that, that's just one of the examples. Or, you know, just what I, I gave you the example about before, that the testimony of a Christian is worth half of a Muslim. So, you know, these are serious issues that stand in the way of equality in Iran. And as long as Iran, or any other country for that matter, is run by Sharia law, these serious problems will remain. A bigger question than just human rights is broadening it to the whole question of what are the chances for democracy in, let's say, Iran, but broaden it to all of the Middle East, which has no tradition for this. Mm -hmm. You've said elsewhere, uh, democracy can't be exported, it has to be achieved. Democracy isn't an event, it's a process. Tell us how you'd see that working out even during this Arab Spring. Um, how do you see it playing out long term? 
You know, first of all, I think it's important to understand that in history, 30 years is nothing. The Iranian Revolution happened about 30 years ago. Now, if you compare, let's say, Hosni Mubarak to the Shah, there are a lot of similarities there. You know, yeah. backed up dictators by the West, you know. Uh, yes, they give personal liberties to the people, the, but the political liberties are very limited, and then eventually people get fed up and they rise up against it. They are very similar, aren't they? So, in Iran, the people rose against the system 30 years ago. And then 30 years later, we are seeing the same thing happening in many countries in the Arab world. My analogy is that what we are calling today the Arab Spring really began in Iran yeah, 30 years ago. And now we are just seeing it continue. Now, what is brilliant here from my perspective is that the Iranian revolution showed us that a lot of things can go wrong. That when a people rise and that they demand justice and democracy, they are not necessarily going to do it. When the tsunami of a revolution is unleashed, to control that energy is extremely difficult. And anybody who's at the right place, at the right time, might be able to control it. So in Egypt right now, for example, the people of Egypt, I congratulate them for being able to stand up and bring about change. But at the same time, there is, a policy, there is a possibility that in their country, just like Iran, some political or religious extremists might hijack the revolution. And we have to be aware of these facts. As we're recording this program, this very week of the record, we saw another regime fall after 42 years, which was Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. Would you find it another parallel example of just because a thing falls, it doesn't mean something good rises? You know, I think that is a reality that it would be very illogical to dismiss. The possibility that things will get better in Libya exists. And the possibility that things will get worse in Libya exists. These realities are out there, and we cannot deny them. But what we can do is we can try to help things get better. And the best way to do that from where I'm standing and who I am as a writer, as a speaker, is to make sure that I write as many articles as I, and as many books and I give as many talks as possible to warn people of the danger out there. One thing that you've written about that I find really intriguing is saying that Iran is suffering from PTSD. Mm. And why I find it you know, very real yeah. is I lived in Santo Domingo and I know when I went there in 72 after the revolution there, uh, they also were saying the people are going to be in this difficult, traumatic moment for a long time. Mm. Then you connect that to yourself and say, people can have PTSD, countries. Do you find, can you flesh this out a little for us, Marina, so people will understand how something that might be a designation that seems medical and clinical mm -hmm. could also be um, helpful politically to understand how a culture works. It's suffering from something. Uh, yeah, it, it is reality, really, because countries are made of people. So if one human being can, can suffer from a psychological situation, when you put a bunch of people together and you have 70 million of them, actually the effects are much greater. So it is this, the same problem and it has the same symptoms, but you multiply it by 70 million. When a human being has a post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, they become disoriented, they become confused, they think they are normal, they think they can think clearly, but in reality they cannot. So the people of Iran are exhausted from all the sufferings that they have had to undergo for the, next, for the last few years, all the torture, all the executions, all the suffocation, you can't say this, you can't say that. And all of these pre this pressure exhausts people. 
And then there's the fear that if you say a word, you're going to be shot in the head. So this is trauma. And what it can cause is eventually an extreme sense of anger that can lead to hatred. And hatred can lead to violence. And violence doesn't usually lead to good places. It usually just take us, takes us back. So I think it is important for the people of Iran to hear these stories, to be aware of these situations, so that when the time comes for them to make a decision of what to do and how to move ahead and change the situation that has been governing them, at least they have an idea of the road ahead, of the things that can go wrong, and which would be the safest way to proceed. Closing on a very positive note, because you are a very positive person, you have your essay on democracy in Iran, and then you close with a thought that says this, and I'd like you to comment on it. Mahatma Gandhi led his country to independence through nonviolent civil disobedience. And if this was possible in India, it is also possible in Iran. Tell us why you do take hope in people like Gandhi and why you are still positive about the need for us to dream of alternatives to this downward spiral. After the 79 revolution, I watched as the people who had had close ties to the old regime were executed without trial, and the pictures of their bloodied bodies uh, appeared on the front page of newspapers. Now, I'm hearing Iranians uh, sometimes say that when this regime falls, we are going to kill and torture and execute all the people oh who have ties to the current regime. This is not what we want to happen. Yeah. Violence only leads to violence. Revenge and justice, they are two very different concepts. Oh, yeah. We do not need more revenge. We do not need more killing. This is why I think it's very important for someone, people, to remind, you know, speakers like me, writers like me, to remind the people of Iran that there are other ways to, 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 to get forward, to achieve democracy and freedom. Like Mahatma Gandhi, that would be a very good example. Thank you very much, Marina. It has been a privilege, an honor, and a joy to have hosted for two weeks Marina Nimat to share with us her experience and her hope for a different future, not only for Iran, but for herself and her family and for us. Thank you for being here. We hope you'll be here again next week. God bless. Mm -hmm.